suit because of like I wanted to feel like oh the, you want to feel official the, the official you, energy you, 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 you look great <laughs> thank you you too <laughs> hi Brentley thank you so much coming to coming out for coming on to Venture with Grace today. yeah thanks for having me okay so to give the audience a little bit of your background mm -hmm. you are originally so basically you were originally from your family were from Russia mm -hmm. and then you were working while you were in college and then you were uh you went to this thing like at noon so basically you went to i don't know if it's like an event or something at noon and then like basically you were listening to this governor official pitch something yeah yeah you, you want to tell the story like, yeah let's yeah, i'll let sure. you tell the story and then sure so, yeah, so then like, like, like you said i i grew thing. up and i was really into i didn't even know what venture capital was till later in my life but mm -hmm. but i grew up really interested in politics but you know my i'm a first generation american uh, my family wasn't particularly wealthy or, you know, didn't really know anybody. Um, so I didn't really know how to break into politics. But in 1992, and this shows you how old I am, um, I had just finished my freshman year of college. And my dad was a friend with a guy who was a lawyer for the Carpenters Union. And this guy, Brian O'Dwyer, knew that I was interested in politics. And Brian said to me, hey, I can get you a one-day Carpenters Pass for the convention would you like to go? And this was the Democratic National Convention, which was being held in Madison Square Garden. Uh, this was the convention that nominated Bill Clinton to, to run for president. And I said, sure, sounds great. And so, you know, back in the days, people looked at newspapers to get information. If you look in the newspaper, it said convention noon to midnight, which was technically accurate. But as I've now learned, having been to multiple conventions, nothing really gets going until about 8 p.m. But I don't know this. So I show up at noon. And it's empty. And Massport Garden, by the way, when it's empty, is like a big empty place. And it's like three dudes running for state rep in Montana speaking, and like totally no one there. But I'm Ed Rendell, who at the time uh, was the mayor of Philadelphia, and I had just finished my freshman year at Penn, so I you know lived in Philly as well. Um, he was sitting in the audience by himself, and I figured, you know what? Let me go say hi to him. The worst that happens is he'll tell me to go away. And now that I know Rendell pretty well, he was probably literally just talking to the empty chair until I showed up anyway. And so I go over, say hello, explain, you know, I go to school in his city. We have a really good conversation. And he said at the end of it, about 10, 15 minutes later, are you really busy back to school? I said, not particularly. He said, would you like an internship? I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. He said, okay, send me a letter. We'll set it up. So I go home. I write a letter. And every day I'm checking the mailbox and there's no reply. And correspondence, which I know now but didn't understand at the time, is like the black hole of government, right? Everything goes in, nothing comes out. And so I never hear back from them. And I get back to school. And this is like a decade before 9-11, so security is nowhere near what it is today. And I thought, I'll go see him. And I was so sort of naive and gullible that it didn't occur to me that you can't like just go ask to see the mayor of Philadelphia. And so I get to not his assistant, but like the outer office assistants. And I said, can I see the mayor? And it was such a crazy thing to ask because who does that? That they were like these nice old Italian ladies from South Philly. And they were like, well, he's a little busy, but you can leave a note. Okay. So I write a note. I get back on the subway to go back to the dorm. Kind of hits me like, you idiot. You, you, you can't do that. Uh, and I wrote it off. And about 10 minutes later, the phone rang. They said, please hold for the mayor. And he said, when are you coming to work? And I said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And I worked for him all through college. And that's how I got started. That's amazing. <clears throat> I feel like there is some sort of random randomness, but also like there's like the grit and the hustle. And then you are, you know, you have the boldness to like ask the mayor to just meet you and stuff like that. And I wonder, like, okay, so after that, later on, you worked for Michael Bloomberg, mm -hmm. Michael Bloomberg's campaign, and then later on, you were, you know. Uber's like first like lawyer who was like taking them on for mm -hmm. the battle with the government. Yeah. Um, and then now you have a fund. The whole fund strategy is kind of like going after these like regulated industry. And uh, I wonder like, you know, throughout your journey, what are some like key lessons that you kind of like learned early on in your career? And then you mentioned that you didn't come from like a very successful family or whatever. And but eventually you're very successful yourself. I wonder uh, who is on your personal board of advisors when it comes to developing your own career? Yeah. I mean, the, f the first thing is, um, and, I, and if the listeners and, and viewers find this interesting, um, a couple months ago, I turned 50 and on my Medium page, 
um, I, and we can put a link up somewhere to this, wrote, a, wrote an essay called, you know, 50 Reflections Upon Turning. 50 were a lot of the career sort of th lessons that I've learned over the years I tried to share uh, with, with my readers. Um, but a few things. So the, the, the first thing is, and it's funny, I was literally just interviewing someone for a job right before this. And he said, like, so what do you care about? And I said, I care people who get things done, right? I care about uh, hustle and worth, worth at work ethic and street smarts and character and integrity. Um, I don't care what school you went to. I don't care what your IQ is. You know, I don't care about prestige. I want people who can make things happen, right? And I have learned over the course of my career, those are the people who succeed. Right. Like, sure. And I have a senior in high school right now, my daughter. So I'm sort of very aware of what the whole mm -hmm. college process is like. And I think that her experience has been better than some of her friends simply because my attitude has been, I don't really care where you go to college. Right. I, I want you to, to work hard and learn and, and enjoy yourself. But like, I don't really think life is dictated by like the ranking of the school that you went to. And in fact, if anything, I tend to shy away from people who really come from really prestigious schools sometimes because I worry that what well, they might have an extra few IQ points, but they don't necessarily have the commensurate grit and hustle like you just said a few minutes ago, uh, which is really what determines success a lot more. So to, to me, that's probably been the most important lesson. Um, and I would say the most important mentor I had was Mike Bloomberg. Um, and what I learned from Mike is really his, his management style, right, which is hire the best people you can get, doesn't matter where they come from, um, treat them well, pay them well, give them autonomy, and in return, expect a lot of production, a lot of loyalty, and they're going to work really hard. Um, and I have, whether it's my venture fund, my consulting firm, my foundation, my bookstore, whatever it's been, I've tried to use that approach for hiring and managing people. Um, and it, you know, look, it doesn't work with everybody, but overall it's worked pretty well. Totally. Uh, I want to say hi to the audience. Hi, Dina. So anyway, so going back to your story, um, what does it mean for hiring the best people? Like what is the best people? I know you mentioned best people is kind of like getting things done. And how do you evaluate that when you're hiring? Because I it's hard. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's hard, right? Because because what I'm saying is the the I think the reason why typically people use things like academic pedigree as a proxy is because you can see it on a resume, right? Say, oh, mm -hmm. this person went to Yale, they must be really good. Now, what I've mm -hmm. learned over the years is you're probably intellectually capable if you went to Yale. That doesn't mean you're good at anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, you might be, but but you know, some of my best employees went to Yale, and we've also people went to Yale didn't work out at all, right? So um, that in and of itself, to me, doesn't mean much. So I I think it's a, a question of trying to get a sense more about this person's values and character, and you know, what have they gotten done in previous jobs that are meaningful. Uh, what kind of creativity do they bring into the table, right? So like to me, one of the things that I really value the most is people can come up with crazy ideas, right? And that's one of the things that makes working in venture mm -hmm. capital so fun. Um, it doesn't mean that we're gonna do the crazy idea, but I would always rather have someone have an unconventional approach to something and pitch it to me um, than just say, oh, we have to do it this way because that's how it's always been done. So what kind of creativity are you demonstrating? And then also for us, you know, references, not just regular, but off-sheet references, um, where it's not the people that you give me, but other people we can find uh, who have worked with you who can say like, yes, Grace is mm -hmm. the kind of employee who just works and works till it gets done and figures it out. And when one door is closed, she finds the next one. Um, or like, yeah, Grace is really smart and she's really nice. And, you know, when they just say a bunch of platitudes like that mm -hmm. uh, to get my guess is that you're not for me. And then the other thing is, you know, we're not shy about moving people along. Right. So, like I said, we, we try to treat our employees really well. We try to pay really well. We try to give people a lot of autonomy. But after a certain amount of time, if it's not working out, um, you're not doing anyone any favors by just keeping them around. Mm, I wonder, okay, so let's talk about your journey with Uber and the, how that translates into like how you manage your current fund, right? Sure. Um, what I thought was really interesting was, you know, like um, you mentioned, I guess like there were a couple scenarios at uber like back in time um there were a lot of like challenges so i'm just gonna generalize because sure. i feel like i will get all the detail wrong by saying anything because i'm not like i'm not a lawyer i don't know how to describe something very <laughs> in a legal term sure. but anyway so tell there is like uber have went through like a lot of challenges you guys mm -hmm. for a uh, first encounter you when you first encounter them um people were like talking about this 
uh, random startup that were doing yep. like transportation stuff. And then there were income some challenges and then they gave you equity because they don't have money and yep. um, you took them on. And then um, basically there were like some challenges that you have to face through um, these like really interesting legal situations. And I wonder um, throughout venture, like when you're looking at venture capital as a whole category, you have done many interesting deals that are, you know, you were in crypto, you were, you know, doing insurance, um, lemonade and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what are the category of things that you feel like is lucrative yeah. when it comes to like, you know, here's yeah. kind of how it all ties together, I think. Right. Yeah. So when I started working with Uber, we were this tiny little tech company, a series A startup. Um, and at the time, you know, right now everyone thinks Uber is this sort of big, bad, giant corporation, mm -hmm. but that we weren't that at all. And at the time, the taxi industry was very muscular and very wealthy and very politically connected, and they didn't want us to exist. And we had to figure out a strategy for how we were going to, even though they had all the money and they had all the connections and all the political friends and everything else. And what we realized was that if we mobilized our own customers, right, if we took the people who were using Uber and really preferred it to the traditional method of getting a taxi and said, hey, if you want this to continue through your phone, we need you to email, tweet, text, call, in some way tell the relevant elected official and we connect it directly to whoever it is, city council member, mayor, whatever, um, I want this thing to stay. You know, that's the only way to even the, even the scales. And we did millions of people over a couple of year period ended up weighing in with their politicians to say, I want this thing, don't take it away from me. Um, and that worked. And what that really led me to start thinking about is, you know, the, the broader relationship and nexus between technology and regulation. And when my partner Jordan Off and I started our fund, you know, in many ways, we're like every early stage venture fund. We're looking at the TAM, we're looking at the founder, we're looking at the underlying idea, the underlying tech. But then we asked two questions that I think are pretty specific to us. The first is, is there a gating regulatory issue or opportunity that if it were solved can really drive growth and valuation? And if so, can we solve it? And when the answer is yes to both, that's when it really makes sense for us to deploy capital. So the first deal we ever did was FanDuel. And then we ran campaigns in 16 states to legalize daily fantasy sports betting. Second deal was Lemonade, like you said, got their insurance licenses everywhere. Roman legalized prescription via text and so on. Um, we're now investing out of our third fund, uh, started raising our fourth. Uh, but the underlying thesis is still kind of what it's been uh, from day one. It's really finding companies and, and the verticals can vary, right? So we do a lot in digital health. We do a pretty decent amount in fintech gaming, mobility, but I'm less concerned about the name of the sector and more about one is just an incredible founder with an incredible idea that could become a multi-billion dollar company. And two, is there something happening on the political side, the regulatory side, the media side, that if me and my team did our jobs well, could materially increase their chances of success? And when the answer is yes to both, that's when it really makes sense for us to get involved. And because we're unique in our space, uh, when the answer is yes to both, you know, we rarely ever lose a deal because the founder realizes they need us too. Totally. Can we use something that you recently invested as an example, either Alma or sure. Maza or like um, AI powered contract mm -hmm. company, the contract yeah, network, like whatever, sure. like you feel like. Um, yeah, let's, 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 let's use it. We'll start with Alma just because it's, it's like, a home run company. So Alma, mm -hmm. um, we've now invested in a couple of times. It was the first deal we ever led. Uh, it was out of our second fund and we've continued to deploy capital into it through different vehicles of our own. Um, so Alma is the back end for therapists. So when you're a mental health professional, turns out you're two things. One that you want to be, which is a therapist that helps people. And one that most of them really don't want to be, which is a small business person, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of the stuff that they think is just a pain in the ass to deal with the insurance, the payments, the booking, the scheduling, all that stuff that they don't really want to have to do, Alma has automated the entire thing, right? So now they do all the backend stuff that therapists don't want to do. Therapists like it more. There's over 20,000 of them on our platform. Um, payers, insurances like it more because it's just much easier for them to deal with than getting paperwork from all these individual people. Um, and so the company has just taken off uh, and has absolutely soared. Uh, but we've had you know multiple areas where the regulatory work that we do has become important. The first is in what's called, it's gonna sound a little technical, but it's cross state licensure. So what that means is that, Grace, if you're a therapist in New Jersey and I'm a patient in 
Wyoming, uh, traditionally you would not be allowed to treat me because mm. you're not licensed to practice medicine in the state of Wyoming. But when mm. telemedicine was created, all of a sudden it's like, wow, uh, why mm. can't someone in Wyoming who needs access to mental health care uh, be able to take advantage of a really smart therapist in New Jersey? And so that's called cross-state licensure, which means that the, the two states allow mm. each other to work together. So when COVID hit, that really opened up a lot because the government understood that like, you know, people won't be able to go see whether it's their therapist or really any kind of doctor that much. And they didn't want people going to the hospitals any more than they absolutely had to. Um, they started opening that up. And since then, we've been fighting to keep it as open as possible. Um, a lot of the sort of old school entrenched medical interests that, you know, don't want competition and want to sort of rule the roost, you know, they like to say, well, you can only have a license in my state if I'm on the medical board and if I say so. And that's bullshit, right? That's just protectionism. And it hurts consumers and it hurts doctors and it hurts society as a whole. So that's the first thing. The second thing we've been doing with them is President Biden uh, about a year ago said that mental health funding should be on par with physical health funding. And we have used that that order and that edict um, to really help promote uh, almost position around Here's how we're able to help promote mental health, mm -hmm. use that to reach uh, therapists, use that to reach customers, use that to reach payers, um, and really have worked with the White House specifically around how do we help you further this message because furthering that message builds our network, builds our platform, and makes our company more valuable. Mm. Okay, so when you encounter Oma, like what were they like? Because I know that like you mentioned there's like two things that you evaluate, right? Number one is like, um, can this like drive growth valuation? So like, uh, basically, like, how do you see how big is the market? And then like, what are yeah. the contacts of the founder? Because like, when people say incredible founder, I'm just like, I think everyone is incredible in Silicon Valley. <laughs> like, literally everyone yeah. is so smart and so hardworking, like, all unconventional. Right. Literally everyone say they, oh, you know, I'm like, you know, I didn't get into blah, blah, blah in like the most like, traditional way but actually it's like traditional and still like how you not to do right. the non-traditional right. things so i wonder like how do you evaluate if this is the opportunity for you um, yeah i mean and look it's early stage venture so we, we get it wrong plenty and the good news about early stage venture is when you hit the almas uh, mm -hmm. really early, that makes up for a lot of mistakes, right? Because mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, the vast majority of our care and the returns for our LPs come from the handful of really, really giant grand slams, as mm -hmm. opposed to a bunch of singles and doubles. Um, but look, with Alma, Harry Ritter, who's the founder, is both a doctor and a business person. Um, his original vision for Alma was actually both physical and digital. So it was like, we work for therapists, combined with uh, telehealth. And then, and the business at first was struggling. And um, when COVID hit and Jordan, my partner was on the board of Alma, Harry and Jordan made a really important decision, which was we're going to close down all the physical locations and we're going to go fully digital. Um, and then because A, people, the need for mental health care during COVID became so much more prevalent. Um, and what Jordan and I had bet, I, I remember because the first deal we ever led, remember how anxious we were, because like it's the most biggest check we'd ever written at the time. And I really even remember like where I was standing when I was on the phone with Jordan trying to figure it out, pacing around the room. And ultimately, the bet that we made was that stigma around mental health treatment would decline and as a result, usage would increase. Right. So I, I live in New York City. Everyone has a therapist. There's really no stigma around it at all. And what Jordan and I felt was this is the direction the world's going in. And if we believe that and we believe in the founder and the tech and we believe that we can sort of open up as many it, it, it kind of, or overcome as many regulatory barriers as possible to treatment. Uh, this could become a really big business. And we bet right, you know, and part of it was that Harry was the right founder. Part of it was um, that the stigma did decline. And part of it w was luck in the sense that COVID really did provide a tremendous boost to that business. And 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 look, they've run with it and succeeded and never looked back. So it's all credit to Harry and his team. Um, but yeah, but I think for us, you know, we were betting on both our ability to eliminate uh, regulatory roadblocks and we were betting on social normative change, right? Like if you think about Uber, mm -hmm. it was a normative change. All of a sudden people decided, I'll get in the backseat of a stranger's car, right? And not even mm -hmm. like a taxi driver, like someone driving their Toyota Camry or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Airbnb, I'll sleep on someone else's couch, 
right? Even if they're in the next room. Uh, these are normative changes where, you know, society says, you know, we're now willing to do something we weren't comfortable doing before. Um, and our, our bet in Alma was the normative change was that instead of people kind of looking at you funny, if you said you were in therapy or in treatment, people say, oh, that's great. I am too. Or uh, that's great. So is my brother or my kid or whatever it is, which is, I think, the direction the world's gone in the last couple of years. Mm. I wonder, like, what do you think are the things that you can solve? So, for example, I feel like um, a lot of the changes that you were mentioning about like Uber or about something else, um, they are backed by like the entire traditional industry that's like um, with a lot of layer of um, wealthy, influential people. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you observe the change was going to happen. Like, so basically in not like, get, not trying to get into like anything political, but like, what are things that could be shift towards and like, how do you kind of like change something? So I think you talked about like maybe running mini campaigns or whatever to um, getting people like vote for certain things or not. Mm -hmm. Like, so I wonder like, how does it work to actually make it happen? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, some of it, like like I just described, is that sort of theoretical process when we're doing diligence on a company and trying to decide, hey, do we think that this is the right investment? And do we think we can succeed on the regulatory front? And then, like you said, there's the real world of actually doing it, right? And so, mm -hmm. like, to use FanDuel as the example, um, when we invested, uh, they were operational in every state, and then this big scandal hit. And all of a sudden, attorney generals from all over the country started sending them cease and desist letters saying you have to stop operating in the state of Illinois or Texas or Massachusetts or whatever it is. And then we had to fix that, right? Uh, in a lot of cases, fixing that meant that we had to pass legislation through the state legislature, both chambers get signed by the governor um, over the objections of the casino industry, over the objections of, of a lot of people on the left and the right um, that allowed daily fantasy sports betting and categorize it as a game of skill. Um, sometimes we had to, we didn't need legislation, but we had to work it out with the relevant regulator to say, no, this is legal under your existing statutes and here's why. Um, sometimes we needed changes to, to rules. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a variety of different things, but ultimately for our work, you know, yes, there's the conceptual, like, are we willing to bet on this normative change, but also are we willing to, and we think we can pass this bill in 20 different states? Can we block this bad thing from happening in 15 cities? Uh, Bird, you know, we had to launch Bird in 60 cities in like a three week period. Mm -hmm. um, in some places, all we needed to really do is give them a heads up that we're coming in. In some places, um, we sought more uh, kind of a, a cooperation and permission. In a few states like New York and Illinois, electric scooters were actually illegal. We had to go to the state capitol and pass legislation to legalize the underlying product and then operate uh, in, in those markets and in those states. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of groundwork. And, and one of the reasons why we really don't invest unless we can take double digit ownership of a company is we put in so much work for our portfolio companies and we do it all for free, right? This is just part of what you get uh, if we choose to invest in you. Um, but it's so labor intensive on our side that it's not really worth doing. Like I passed on a deal yesterday that I love the company, but their round was just really, it was a really high valuation, kind of hadn't seen stuff like that in a while. And even at my biggest check size, I would own barely 5% of the company. And yes, they're going to have all kinds of regulatory issues. And yes, I do think we could solve those issues. Um, but for a, you know, a low single digit percentage of ownership, it's not worth my team spending all that time and effort um, to, to try to solve those problems. What does your team look like? And that how is a problem getting solved? So also, is there some sort of template? By the way, hi, Yuri. Um, anyway, so is there some sort of like template for this? Because, um, you know, when we're talking about Bird, when we're talking about Coinbase, when we're talking about like Lemonade, they're like all in different sectors. Yeah, there's there's not. I mean, the, the template is really simply that one, because we're working on so many portfolio companies at the same time all over the country, we have a decent sense of what's happening on the ground. So that gives a sense of what's politically feasible or not. And because me and everyone on the team on the platform side have been in politics, you know, for, for decades, um, we've just seen this at every angle. And keep in mind, you know, I spent the first part of my career 
working directly in government. So, you know, I, I was the deputy governor of Illinois and I ran the state's budget and operation, legislation, policy and communications. Uh, I worked for Mike Bloomberg at City Hall in New York. I worked for Evan Dell at City Hall in Philadelphia. I worked in the U.S. Senate for Chuck Schumer. Um, and so I learned how these things actually get done. And so the, look, what makes venture both really fun and really difficult is this is not, you know, rinse, wash, repeat, whatever it is. Like, yes, there's pattern mm -hmm. recognition for sure. But overall, every idea, fundamentally, if you're investing in it, and, and because we're early stage investors, every deal we do is designed to underwrite the entire fund, right? So fund three, which we're investing out of right now, it's a $140 million fund. We have to believe that we will make $140 million upon the exit of that company for us to make the investment. Now, sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not true. It doesn't need to be true in every case for the fund to make a lot of money. Um, but um, the, everything is different, which makes it both difficult, but also a lot more interesting as a result. And so uh, the team is split into two groups. You know, one is the traditional side that most VCs have, which is the investment team, right? And we've got associ mm -hmm. senior associates and associates and a whole group of people that source deals, diligence deals, and then work with our portfolio companies on the more basic blocking and tackling that any VC would deal with. Um, and then there's the platform side. And those are people who I've worked with over the years in government and politics and media, and they've run political campaigns and legislative campaigns, uh, and they understand how to get things done in government, in politics. And, you know, we work directly with our portfolio companies to solve whatever regulatory challenges they face. So our, our team is probably a little bigger than maybe other funds with our AUM, and it probably our fund costs more to operate um, than other funds with our AUM. Um, but, as, but because we're able to offer something to our portfolio companies, because we're literally the only fund in venture that I'm aware of that does what we do, um, we don't really ever lose a deal because, you know, my pitch, let's say you're the founder, is it's pretty simple. Like, look, Grace, if you succeed, you're going to have this regulatory problem, this problem, this problem, and this problem. And you have two ways to go about it. You could hire a bunch of firms and lobbyists and companies and pay millions of dollars, and hopefully they can solve the problem for you. Or I can give you five million bucks and I'll do it for free. Um, you know, it's a pretty good sales pitch. And so on one hand, we don't lose a lot of deals, which is what enables us to have really good returns. On the other hand, it is a labor intensive model. Mm. Um, you chat about this and your, the comparison between you guys and maybe like X6 and Z or some company that, or like some funds that are like hiring a bunch of lawyers to try to recreate this in their own fund. Yeah. Basically you mentioned that like, because of you are a investor and a operator, like, so like you understand both party, you understand both side of things. Um, I wonder like, what are, I think like that's a good value proposition. I wonder, um, does that change in the world of AI? I know you did like a episode on AI yourself on your podcast, um, mm -hmm. and then you have invested in AI companies, obviously. And I wonder, I guess like how do you think about in the going forward yeah. with AI, and then will that shape, like will that change the dynamic of how? of how people invest and yeah for sure right. um look on on one hand i always worry about any trend right whether it's web3 mm -hmm. or crypto or the creator economy or whatever it is because frequently those deals be, are overvalued and every have everyone chasing the same deals and you know they look great for a little while but ultimately they don't succeed and they don't make any money right however mm -hmm. ai is not a trend in and of itself so i would say we're not an ai fund but at this point, if a portfolio company of mine is not using AI, I want to understand why they don't need it, right? And so, mm -hmm. and we have made plenty of investments in the space. I think where we maybe see it from a, an investment standpoint a little differently is um, we see it less as its own category and more as a tool that pretty much all of our portfolio companies should be using, right? So, for example, Elaborate Health. Uh, Elaborate Health, you know, for those of you who have like gone to the doctor, you know, gotten blood work done, they send you the report. And it's incomprehensible. So, you know, glucose 0.72. And now you're Googling glucose 0.72 and trying to figure out, good, is it bad? What's the range? Mm -hmm. You have no idea. And then you call your doctor and you're trying to get them on the phone and you're taking time. They need to see other patients. Um, Elaborate uses AI to take your lab results and turn them into clear, plain English or whatever the relevant language is mm -hmm. and infographics that show you, okay, Here's what this specifically means. And you still may need to want to call your doctor, but most of the time you actually won't need to because you got your answers to your questions, right? Um, now, Elaborate uses AI to do all of this. We consider Elaborate a digital health company, 
right? Not mm-hmm. specific, when we invested in them, it's because we are very heavily invested in the digital health sector. Uh, and because Nicole Barkowski, the founder and CEO, we think is just a phenomenally talented, you know, operator. Um, but you know, is it an AI company in the sense that they're using AI to do their underlying work? Absolutely. Or you mentioned the contract network a couple of minutes ago. Um, the contract network believes that you shouldn't have to hire lawyers every time you want to have any sort of contract with anybody because that becomes incredibly slow and incredibly expensive and you're able to say okay i want this kind of contract in this is a situation and they use ai to say okay here are the relevant legal terms you need to include here's the language here are the market comps here's everything you need to know to put together a legally binding contract um now I would say the contract network is a legal tech company, but of course they're using AI um, in order to do the underlying work. And so the first thing is, I think that, you know, you hear a lot of VCs talking about AI as this new category. I think we see it less as a category and more as a tool um, that we frequently do invest in, but it's not the underlying reason for the investment. So that's number one. And then the second question would be from a regulatory standpoint, um, where is it going, right? And it's interesting. So Europe in general is far more advanced when it comes to tech regulation than the U.S. So the EU in December did adopt an initial framework for how to regulate AI that I think was pretty smart. And what they said was, look, this thing is so new. No one really knows what it is yet or what it's going to be. But we know where it can do a lot of harm. So they created categories and said, if if your AI surveillance technology, for example, you have to meet these standards, you have to satisfy these rules and everything else. Um, whereas if it's, you know, like making, I'm handing up, holding up my spin drift, if it's AI that makes water, uh, no big deal, right? <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not worried about that. So um, I think the EU structure makes sense. But um, on one hand, while we are certainly keeping an eye out for all kinds of AI regulations in the U.S., the U.S. has not been particularly proactive so far when it comes to regulating tech. So Internet 2.0 uh, ha- has yet to be regulated. So all of the harms that we see with rising teenage suicide rates and self-harm and all these terrible things due to the toxicity of our social media platforms um, around the world, they have imposed regulations to try to protect kids online, protect teenagers, protect users. The U.S. has done virtually nothing. Um, You see individual states trying to do something. Florida actually has something going today. Uh, New York's got an interesting bill happening. But at the federal level, despite, you know, and there were hearings last week where Mark Zuckerberg stood up and apologized, and yet it's all theater, right? They're not going to actually do anything or get anything done. And so on one hand, I'm not sure that major AI regulations in the U.S. are coming anytime soon because we haven't even imposed the regulations we should have imposed 10 years ago for the old version of the Internet, let alone the new version of the Internet. Um, But with that said, you know, when we look at investments, the question becomes, one, um, do we think that from a regulatory standpoint, there's anything about this technology, if it's AI, that ultimately would be politically problematic? Or two, you know, okay, eventually, if this sector is going to be regulated, whether it's by state government, local government, federal government, whoever it is, you know, what are the relevant provisions likely to be? Who are the political forces that are going to shape what those rules are? And can we either make sure that we shape it in the direction of our portfolio companies so they get what they need? um, Or can we can we exclude ourselves from it entirely? But sometimes the answer is, look, this thing is going to be a big deal. And our tiny little seed or Series A company is not going to have the political weight to fight this thing out. Uh, You know, with an Uber, with a FanDuel, with a Bird, with an Ease, you have a product that people are so passionate about that you can mobilize your customers and mass through the app and really shift the underlying politics as a result. But that's not true for every portfolio company, for every startup. And so there are times where, you know, we don't do a deal because we're like, you know what, we think this political fight is not winnable or the odds of winning it are relatively low and we're better off putting our money into this thing instead. Let me summarize what you just said to me okay so i think when you're thinking about what can be solved or what it's like opportunity or not are based on a couple of things number one is can are people so passionate about this product that like they can eventually shape how politics work so eventually shape like how government think like yep. if everybody if like the government official are gonna call over and he, like <laughs> they probably gonna change their mind yep. at one point yeah so basically that's one thing and then the mm-hmm. other thing is um so i feel like i hear that there should be a legal mode 
um, that can exist in your portfolio companies. Um, and on the other hand, like, you know, you mentioned about like, you know, the AI, so the EU uh, legal document and everything. So I wonder, like, when you are, how do you, like, what's your content diet look like to educate yourself on the new things? And then how do you stay grounded and then making sure that you understand what's the meaning behind these legal documents? Yeah. Um, because, yeah. It's a mix. So I, I think the... It, the answer to your question is important to, for me to both describe what content I do take in, but I think just as important what I don't take in, right? So uh, the first thing is, you know, I have to understand government and politics and what's happening, right? So I read every day mm -hmm. a bunch of newspapers, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Post, New York Daily News. Um, and then I'm reading specific publications. So on the venture side, you know, like everyone term sheet, but I'm looking at TechCrunch and I'm looking at Venture B. I'm looking at all of these different publications to see what's happening in terms of what deals are getting done, what ideas are out there. But then I also have to look at Politico and Pluribus and all of these uh, regulatory publications to see what bills are getting introduced and what bills are moving through the process and which things are having a hard time so that, you know, even if the underlying theses of politics are rel relatively consistent from year to year and state to state, um, the specific on the ground conditions change and shift constantly everywhere. And we've got to keep up to date uh, with those. So the way that on the platform side, people have sp uh, specific areas of expertise. Like Quinn Sheehan, for example, is our digital health person. Quinn is the vice chair of the American, Te American Telemedicine Association. She's on the Uniform Commission of State Laws. Um, and Quinn really is, I would argue, the nation's foremost expert uh, when it comes to digital health regulation. So, you know, I'm, I have a general sense of what's happening with federal CMS on Medicaid reimbursement rules or, you know, these states on cross-state licensure or whatever it is, but Quinn really knows the details of that, right? And, and different people on our team have that for different sectors. So I think for me, it's a question of understanding broadly what's happening, what are the trends kind of shaping things both in tech and in politics, but it's also what I don't do. And, and I have to say, I don't use social media uh, unless you have LinkedIn as at all, right? So I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Snap. Uh, I am not on any platforms at all. And I think that's important for two reasons. One, um, it's just I, I I need the time I have to do my work, right? I need the time mm -hmm. I have to understand this stuff. And then also, you know, I, I write about it, right? So I write a column for the New York Daily News. I've written three books about tech and regulation in different ways. I teach the stuff at Columbia Business School. I do two podcasts a week about it. Um, I need time to create all of that content. And what I find is social media in many ways is the worst of both worlds because one, it sucks you down these rabbit holes where all of a sudden just half an hour is gone. You don't know what mm -hmm. you did. But two, all of this noise gets in my head, right? All of these angry, stupid people <laughs> and like, and they don't know what they're talking about. And yet they act like they're experts on everything. And I don't want that in my head, right? I don't want that polluting my thinking. And so I really try just as much to avoid you know the influences uh of content that i think are either unhelpful or a waste of time as defined content that can really shape my uh shape my learning mm. um how do you spend your time on educate yourself on specific sectors because you guys have consumer digital health enterprise mm -hmm. fintech gaming transportation all that Obviously, I think transportation and fintech are like what I think I recognize the most amount of the log logo. I don't know if it's because yeah. I'm like my, I'm biased because I only study these things. Yeah. But anyway, so I wonder, like, how do you spend your time on educating yourself on specific legal things in these terms? Like, yeah, these I'll be a lot. A lot of it is doing. So one reason that we tend to kind of keep investing in some of the same sectors over and over again is because we're developing one so much expertise in those sectors, and two we already understand what's happening from a regulatory standpoint, what's happening mm -hmm. uh, on state state government and local government, federal government. And by, by doing the work for one portfolio company, we have a pretty good sense of what's already happening. And that's actually the best way to get educated. So yes, we read, we go to conferences, we listen to podcasts, we talk to people, and we do all the same things everyone else does. But I really think that most of our expertise comes from actually doing it. And when you're in a state trying to pass a law, um, and you're dealing with all the political calculations and variables and everything else, 
you get to know the politics of that state really, really well. And then you're able, it's not that hard mentally. We're like, okay, here's the next digital health deal that we're considering. What about the experience that we just had in Ohio makes us think that either we can be successful here or we won't be successful here. Um, and so a lot of it comes from, from on the ground. And if you take the 50, 50 odd portfolio companies that we have and the fact that all of them are regulated in some way, I mean, in total, there's a couple of hundred things happening at any given time. And so some of those were very actively managing. Some of those are, you know, much later stage and they just were, will give us a call for advice or ideas or connections or whatever it is. But I think by being abreast and being in the middle of all of this stuff, it, it tells us what we need to know. When it comes to specific deals, so let's say like Elma, like how do you find the company that you typically invest in like are they like randomly sourced by people or like, no i mean it's, it's a combination it's yeah it's a look i mean part of it is our investment team is out mm -hmm. there pounding the pavement just like any good investment team will and they are you know reaching out to founders on a constant basis and you know introducing themselves and getting a sense of the business and look we're, we're introducing ourselves to founders who have a startup in a regulated space which means most of the time at this point they've heard of us or they do a little bit of Googling and they sort of figure out pretty quickly like, oh, it's worth my talking to these people because at the very worst, I could probably get some free regulatory advice. Um, mm -hmm. So let me see you know, what, what they have to say. And so as a result, the, the conversion rate for us is, is pretty high. So that's some of it. Um, a lot of it is other VCs and founders send us stuff because they know that we can solve a specific pain point and problem, right? So like you mentioned Andreessen earlier, we do a ton of investing with Andreessen. And in fact, we, we just won a Series A, we haven't announced it yet, um, of a company that Andreessen led the seed for. Um, and they pushed hard for us to, to win the, the round. And it's because they know that this company is going to have various regulatory issues and that if we're on the cap table, we can do something about it, right? And if, mm -hmm. if we're some, some other fund, they can't help with that at all. Mm -hmm. And so um, as we keep solving problems for our portfolio companies, because we're never the only investor in a company, um, that keeps reaching other VCs and then they keep sending us more and more deal flow. And then our founders through their own network send us a ton of deal flow because founders talk to other founders. And I think I like to think what they say about us is these guys can add real value because they have a specific skill set, right? And it's not mm -hmm. just like, oh, I understand how to find engineers or, you know, I'm really good at sort of, you know, digital marketing theory. Like this is, okay, we got to pass this law. Either we can pass it or we can't pass it, right? It's very mm -hmm. tangible. Um, and our success rate is high enough that founders will tell their founders, okay, if you're going to have this problem, this issue, these are the people who can help you with it. So we come in pretty recommended. And the third would be, you know, I maintain a reasonably high public profile. Part of that's because of deal flow, right? You know, when I'm on Squawk Box talking about crypto regulation, uh, I don't know why, but founders in every other single sector are like, oh, he must understand my regulatory issues too. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, whether it's, you know, speaking at conferences or teaching or going on TV or going on things like Venture with Grace or whatever it is, one reason that a good chunk of my time is spent um, out there in public in different ways is for us, that's a tremendous source of A, deal flow and B, validation. When you're thinking about, let's say like a Coinbase and their competitor, how do you pick Coinbase? Or yeah. like, yeah. Coinbase was pretty easy because because we actually got in a little late on Coinbase and they were just soaring and uh, IVP came to us and they were leading the round and said, hey, you know, we'd like to have the optionality of having you on the cap table in case they need your help. And, and we have since worked with Coinbase and different things. Um, but uh, but a lot of times the question becomes really, can we build a regulatory moat for our portfolio company against the other startups in the space? So there's always the question of, can you beat the entrenched interest, the taxi industry, the hotel industry, the casino industry, whatever it's fine, right? But then it's like, okay, you're typically not the only startup in any given sector either. So how do you beat those guys? And then one of the questions we have to ask ourselves in diligence is, is there is their business model unique enough that we can pass regulations and laws that really favor our model compared to our competitors? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Right. So I always tried to find ways to distinguish between Uber and Lyft, you know, in, in regulation. And I never could. The reality is it's the same business model, the same basic offerings. 
um, and I wasn't able to do it. Whereas I've had other portfolio companies, like uh, one that we did, it was actually was a, wasn't a portfolio company, it was a client of our consulting firm, but Pymetrics, which is an AI company in the HR space. And we passed legislation that was highly controversial in New York City Council that imposed additional DEI type reporting requirements in the sector, um, but in part because the, the company wanted to do right, but really more in part because their model was built to automatically do all of that already and their main competitors wasn't, and it gave them a huge advantage, right? And so wherever I think that there's enough of a distinguishing feature between our portfolio company, our potential portfolio company, and others, other startups in the space, um, I'll use that to try to shape the regulations as narrowly as possible to favor our companies. Wow, I'm like literally taking notes. Um, I mean, those are things that, like I will never be able to like think about if I like. So, I, if, if, without this being a shameless pitch, uh, my the first book I wrote is called The Fixer, um, and it's specifically about all the stuff we're talking about. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. You can find that on Amazon. So it does, and it has things like infographics of like, okay, do I ask for permission or beg for forgiveness? Okay, here's what you should think through. And the reality is every startup is different. Every jurisdiction is different. Every context is different. So there's never, a, I, I never have a black and white answer of like, yes, always do this or no, never do that. Um, but at least what I try to do in that book is provide intellectual frameworks for the readers. So as they're thinking about how this applies to their startup or their investments or whatever else, um, they at least have a sense of, of how to think about it the right way. I see on your portfolio, like most of them are like pretty recognizable. I mean, I'm just looking at the fintech sector. There are a couple companies that I could think of. I wouldn't name a uh, high LinkedIn user. I'm sorry. I don't know who this is. But anyway, so I wonder like um, when you're thinking about like what not to invest in, mm -hmm. um, I can think of like so many companies that are like competing with like, I know that you mentioned about like these, you know, you will help this particular startup to build a specific mold for mm -hmm. them in the regulatory arena. But how do you pick this is going to be the winner? Because yeah. some of them are, you know, they're not like. Right. So, so, so sometimes we pick them wrong, just to be clear. We're an early stage venture mm -hmm. fund. We get plenty wrong. And we do have some categories that we tend to shy away from, which I think is also helpful. Right. So, for mm -hmm. example, we only, I think, across the three funds have two investments in GovTech, meaning companies who all of their revenue comes from con government contracts, because you know I've overseen procurement in government. I've overseen the budget office in government, and I know how that process works. And generally speaking, I don't like that as the only revenue source for a portfolio company. If it's one revenue source, great. But if it's the only one, I have to really love everything else about the company and really think there's something specific and unique about these guys um, to make me want to invest. So that's one. Two, if an issue can only be resolved from a regulatory standpoint through Congress, I don't invest. Um, simply because the U.S. Congress is such a disaster. It is so dysfunctional. It is so polarized. It is so extremist that nothing gets done. And I can't base a regulatory strategy or an investment strategy on a miracle, right? When it's state level, one, I got 50 places to play in. So I can sort of figure out like, okay, this will work better initially in red states or blue states or this south or the northeast or whatever it is. Um, and cities, there are hundreds to choose from. Um, and things do get done in those jurisdictions all of the time. And so you might win, you might lose, but at least you have the chance to be successful. But if something is like Congress, you know, for example, we have an investment in the automated trucking space and, you know, we've helped them get permits to operate within individual states. Um, but Congress and the U.S. Department of Transportation are needed to allow for interstate uh, commerce for autonomous trucks and they haven't acted on it much at all and so as a result you know this company has been a little hamstrung by that right and so that's another one third would be would be biotech for for two reasons one we're not a deep tech fund i don't have the ability to sort of evaluate a compound or a molecule and say this is going to work or this is not going to work but two even though the fda process is a highly regulated process it's pretty narrow and prescribed it kind of works the same way most of the time and the truth is the biotech funds at this point know how to do it, right? Like, I don't think I have a material advantage over, you know, experienced biotech funds in getting a drug through the FDA process. But when all of a sudden something is now banned overnight in 23 states and you got to fix that, I know I'm the only one in the venture world. That we're the only ones who can do that. Uh, and so I look for where I have arbitrage. And so those are all sort of at least some precepts that we use to try to shape it. Um, and then when you get through all past all of that, 
you know, it's it's for us a TAM bet and a founder bet, right? It's one, do we believe that this human being is exceptional enough that they have the creativity and the grit and, and the resilience and everything else to get this thing through? And two, is the TAM big enough that even if we're only capturing one or 2% of market share, does that get us to $100 million in revenue, right? Um, at the end of the day, I would say every early stage VC is really asking the exact same question, which is, can this company get to $100 million in revenue in the next five years? Because if the answer is yes, and it's a pretty good chance it's going to be you know, valued in the billions of dollars, um, and that's going to be a pretty successful exit if you, if you invest it early. And if the answer is no, it doesn't really matter how great the company is otherwise, it's still probably not going to return your fund. And so you know, we have to truly believe that this founder is so exceptional and this market is so big uh, that even modest success in this market can yield nine figures in revenue. When you're making the founder bat, I mean, like, I feel like it's super hard. Like, I feel like if you are talking about, like, you know, uh, like, I guess, like, how do you leverage your specific domain knowledge to make the founder bat? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it is less about us identifying some secret thing that no one else can find. I think VCs often know this is the founder mm -hmm. that everyone thinks is the winner. And then there's a race to get that founder to want you to be their lead investor or you to be in the round or someone else. And so I don't know that we have any special special skill set at sort of saying this person is, you know, we see something in them that no one else does. Sometimes that might be the case, but I think generally speaking, it's more, it can be clear this founder is truly exceptional. This idea is truly exceptional. They've got a lot of traction. They've generated a meaningful amount of ARR in a short period of time whatever it is. And then it's, how do I convince that founder to pick me ahead of all of the other funds? And where we tend to do well is if we know that that founder and if the founder knows that they're going to run into all sorts of political and regulatory problems, we have the ability to guide them through that and help them with that. And no other fund does. And that gives us a meaningful advantage in winning deals. When it comes to like the AI companies, you, mm -hmm. you pick the contract network. Yep. And I've personally seen like, you know, 45 competitors around that zone. So I wonder where do you identify as our opportunity and then why did you pick that company? Yeah. So that one really specifically was a founder bet. So the two founders are uh, Jim Wagner, who is one of the senior people at DocuSign, but they're going to Bill Murphy. So Bill is one of the founders of Capital IQ. And then he went to Blackstone as their CTO and my partner, Jordan Off, when Jordan worked at Blackstone and did venture investments off the balance sheet, he worked for Bill. Um, and Bill mm -hmm. is this sort of extraordinary human being. And he's, you know, someone that we've known for a long time and always knew that if he ever chose to, he didn't have, he's, he never has to work again, obviously, but if he chose to, we'd want to be involved with it. And then he got together with Jim and because they've both done so well, they were able to invest a lot of their own personal capital in the business before they even needed to raise any outside money. And so they were able to de-risk it to a certain extent because they were able to build a model and build a platform that didn't even require outside investors at first. And so by the time that we got to them to leave their seed, they were really far along already. And so we said, okay, here's this great product. We think it's been de-risked to a certain extent. We really believe in Jim. We really believe in Bill. We really believe in our ability to navigate these regulatory issues. Because like you said, they're not the only company in the space, but the only ones that we're invested in, right? So that when all of the regulatory headaches come up, I think we're going to be able to navigate them a lot better than any competitors. And that gives us a real advantage. And so, you know, it's, it's in that case, it was probably more of a founder bet. There might be other cases where it's more of a TAM bet. And, and look, there are cases where we're betting on a winner takes all outcome. Right. And it's not can we get one or two percent of the market? It might be a smaller TAM, but we think that the company we're investing in has such a specific ability to win most of those deals. And it's typically enterprise in one way or another um, that uh, they can capture double digits of the market um, and therefore get to sufficient revenue. Where would the regulatory headaches come from for the AI sector or for, you know? So it depends what it is. So for contract network, the main thing that we deal with is the question of unauthorized practice of law. So uh, there's a real question of the contract network. They're not lawyers, right? They're not members of the bar of any given state or anything else. Mm -hmm. They're providing help and assistance to our customers. Um, 
But, you know, how do we make sure that we are in compliance with the rules of saying, here's what you can and can't use technology for, here's what does require sort of a law license, here's what doesn't. And then those rules are going to evolve and shape as AI continues to grow. So we believe that one, we can navigate those for the contract network in different states today. And two, as the rules around AI in this particular space get written, we can make sure we have a seat at the table and we can help write uh, those rules. So that's where that comes into play. Um, for just to use Elaborate Health as another example, you know, right now, no one has written rules yet around the use of AI in interpreting and, and sharing lab results, but eventually someone's going to. So one, how do we make sure that we're shaping that process? How do we see potential problems on the way and spot them? And how, you know, given our relationships now in the state and federal network of CMS and HHS and Medicare and Medicaid, departments of health, state medical boards, and all these different entities, um, how do we use our own relationships and our own credibility to explain what Elaborate is doing to all of the different regulators and politicians so that they're okay with it, right? Um, and so, yeah, but if there's not, like one of the reasons we haven't done generative AI is there's not really a great regulatory use case that I can think, think of that says like, oh, I mean, that you can come up with something, but in reality, if I don't think there's going to be a big regulatory fight or issue, um, I probably shouldn't invest. Um, I'm just like trying to process. I feel like there's so much information out there and then I, I feel like, um, I wonder, okay, so you mentioned like this particular company is about like unauthorized practice of law, but like yep. what are some other general legal problem a AI company would be facing? Let's use like, I mean, I know this is not your portfolio company, but like, let's say like Runway ML or like OpenAI, like what are yeah. the major So companies? I would say if you're OpenAI as an example, one is it's kind of part legal, part political, which is copyright, right? So the New York Times is suing OpenAI right now mm -hmm. saying, hey, you're taking our proprietary work and using it in your analysis uh, to answer questions for users. Therefore, you owe us money if you're going to do that, right? Now, that that's a legal fight, but it's going to turn into a political fight, right? There's going to end up being regulation around this and legislation around this. Um, so that would be one. Um, another would be, you know, where do they fit into the legal protections that platforms have uh, against being held liable for content? Um, right now, if you're Instagram, for example, if I defame you on Instagram, you can sue me, but you can't sue Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but, you know, on a, on a platform that is more of a search engine than it is sort of, you know, an exchange of, of different individuals, you know, where does the protect, liability protection lie? Where, where do you have risk? Where don't you have risk? Um, that would be another area. The third will be just anything that is high profile as open AI is going to attract attention and scrutiny simply because if nothing else, politicians want attention. And they know that if they issue a press release that says, I'm going to go after open AI in this way, in this way, um, people will give them, you know, the attention they want for it. And then you have to be able to deal with that, right? And sometimes you can look at that and say, that's ah, nonsense. We're not going to worry about that at all. It's sometimes like, oh, this might be a really big problem. We better deal with it. Um, and so I think anyone as high profile as them or in a super high profile sector um, that just attracts so much, you know, anything that attracts a lot of media attention, therefore attracts political attention, and therefore you better be ready to deal with every potential variable. What would you do if you're building the OpenAI legal team? Um, I think it'd be a combination of, you know, lawyers who understand copyright law, media law, intellectual property law, um, who understand kind of the, the limitations and lack thereof that, that platforms have um, and, you know, uh, people who are capable of understanding how LLMs work. Uh, you know, look, your lawyers don't need to be your engineers, just like I need to understand my portfolio company's regulatory problems. Um, I don't I can't specifically sit here and usually tell you how the coding works uh, on their underlying product, but you have to understand it well enough to be able to go defend it in court or, or whatever it is. Um, and, I, you know, I think maybe one of the more important lessons for a lot of AI companies is, you know, just hiring the fanciest lawyers you can get or the biggest name law firms you can get doesn't mean you're hiring the right people for you. I think because it has become the moment so easy for AI companies to raise money, they're flush with cash. And therefore, they say, oh, well, if I have the biggest name lawyers in the business, then everyone will take me seriously. 
sometimes those might be the right lawyers, but sometimes they might not. And it gets back to that same conversation we had, you know, 50 minutes ago around, you know, what should you be looking for? And I would say it gets back to street smarts and hustle and work ethic and integrity and character far more than did this person go to Harvard Law School or Stanford Law School or wherever it is. Thank you so much, Bradley. On that note, um, where can the audience find you? By the way, uh, I'm totally going to your bookstore in New York. Yeah, uh, if, if you're interested in the bookstore, it's called PT Netwear. It's on the Lower East Side, uh, 180 Orchard Street between Houston and Stanton. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can go to bradleytest.com. I've got a Substack. Uh, I've got uh, a, a novel that came out a few months ago called Obvious in Hindsight that I think is pretty funny. Uh, a book on mobile voting that I'm working on that's coming out in September. So lots of different ways to, to learn more if you'd like to. Amazing. And then uh, also find Bradley on his podcast as well. Yep, it's Firewall. A, Sorry, my, my team's going to yell me. I, I forgot to mention Firewall. Yep, <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty good. So Grace, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, let me end stream.